Good morning, and thank you for standing by. Welcome to Abbott's first quarter 2024 earnings conference call. All participants will be able to listen only until the question and answer portion of this call. During the question and answer session, you will be able to ask your question by pressing the star 1-1 keys on your touchtone phone. This call is being recorded by Abbott. With the exception of any participants' questions asked during the question and answer session, the entire call, including the question and answer session, is material copyrighted by Abbott. It cannot be recorded or rebroadcast without Abbott's expressed written permission. I would now like to introduce Mr. Mike Camilla, Vice President, Investor Relations. Good morning, and thank you for joining us. With me today are Robert Ford, Chairman and Chief Executive Officer, Bob Funk, Executive Vice President, Finance, and Phil Boudreaux, Senior Vice President, Finance, and Chief Financial Officer. Robert and Phil will provide opening remarks. Following their comments, we'll take your questions. Before we get started, some statements made today may be forward-looking for purposes of the Private Securities Litigation Reform Act of 1995, including the expected financial results for 2024. Abbott cautions that these forward-looking statements are subject to risks and uncertainties that may cause actual results to differ materially from those indicated in the forward-looking statements. Economic, competitive, governmental, technological, and other factors that may affect Abbott's operations are discussed in Item 1A, Risk Factors, to our annual report on Form 10-K for the year ended December 31, 2023. Abbott undertakes no obligation to release publicly any revisions to forward-looking statements as a result of subsequent events or developments, except as required by law. On today's conference call, as in the past, non-GAAP financial measures will be used to help investors understand Abbott's ongoing business performance. These non-GAAP financial measures are reconciled with the comparable GAAP financial measures in our earnings news release and regulatory filings from today which are available on our website at abbott.com. Note that Abbott has not provided the GAAP financial measure for organic sales growth on a forward-looking basis because the company is unable to predict future changes in foreign exchange rates, which could impact reported sales growth. Unless otherwise noted, our commentary on sales growth refers to organic sales growth, which is defined in the press release issued earlier today. With that, I will now turn the call over to Robert. Thanks, Mike. Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we reported first quarter adjusted earnings per share of 98 cents, which was above analyst consensus estimates. We also raised the midpoint of our guidance ranges for both earnings per share and sales growth. We now forecast full-year adjusted earnings per share of $4.55 to $4.70, and organic sales growth excluded COVID testing-related sales of 8.5% to 10%. Organic sales growth excluding COVID testing-related sales was 10.8% in the quarter, which represents the fifth consecutive quarter of double-digit growth. This strong start to the year was driven by broad-based growth across the portfolio, including growth of 14% in medical devices and established pharmaceuticals. In addition to exceeding expectations of both top and bottom lines this quarter, we accomplished a number of objectives across the pipeline, including obtaining several new product approvals and achieving important clinical trial-related milestones. I'll now summarize our first quarter results in more detail before turning the call over to Phil. <clears throat> and I'll start with nutrition, <clears throat> where sales increased 8% in the quarter. Strong growth in the quarter was led by double-digit growth in pediatric nutrition, driven by continued market share gains in the U.S. infant formula business and growth across our international portfolio of infant formula, toddler, and adult nutrition brands. In January, we launched a new nutrition shake called Protality, which provides nutritional support for adults pursuing weight loss. 
as people eat less and lose weight from taking GLP-1 medications, undergoing a weight loss surgery, or following a calorie-restricted diet, a portion of what is lost is lean muscle mass, which plays an important role in overall health. A combination of high protein and essential vitamins and minerals that Propality offers can help people preserve muscle while pursuing their personal weight loss goals. Turning to EPD, where sales increased 14% in the quarter. This quarter was a continuation of EPD's impressive trend of strong performance, including double-digit growth in four of the last five quarters. In addition to a strong track record of top-line growth, this business has delivered equally impressive gains on the bottom line, with an operating margin profile last year that reflected more than 350 basis points of improvement compared to 2019. Moving to diagnostics, where sales increased more than 5%, excluding COVID testing sales. Growth in diagnostics continues to be led by the adoption of our market-leading systems and demand for testing that takes place in a variety of settings, including hospitals, laboratories, urgent care centers, physician offices, retail pharmacies, and blood screening facilities. Our development efforts in diagnostics focus on developing new systems and creating new tests that play an important role in making healthcare decisions, expand the accessibility of testing, and deliver a result as fast as possible. In April, we received FDA approval for a point-of-care diagnostic test that can help determine if someone suffered a mild traumatic brain injury or concussion in just 15 minutes. The test is run on our portable iStat Alinity instrument, which allows concussion testing to move beyond the traditional hospital setting and into urgent care centers, physician offices, and other locations that are closer to the patient. With nearly 5 million people in the US going to the emergency room to be checked for suspected concussion each year, we believe this test has the potential to transform the standard of care for concussion testing. And I'll wrap up with medical devices, where sales grew 14%. In diabetes care, Freestyle Libre sales were $1.5 billion in the quarter and grew 23%. I've previously mentioned that Libre has several new growth opportunities that will help continue to fuel the strong sales trajectory we have forecasted. One of those growth opportunities relates to the continued expansion of reimbursement coverage for Libre for individuals who use basal insulin therapy to manage their diabetes. Last year, we announced that Libre became the first and only continuous glucose monitoring system to be nationally reimbursed in France to include all people who use basal insulin as part of their diabetes management. During this first quarter, Libre obtained reimbursement from a select number of institutional payers in Germany for basal insulin users who also use oral diabetes medication to manage their condition. These select public and private payers cover a limited number of the approximately 1 million basal insulin users in Germany, but this is an encouraging sign of the potential for further coverage expansion not only in Germany, but across other European markets. In cardiovascular devices, sales grew 10.5% overall in the quarter, led by double-digit growth in electrophysiology, structural heart, and continued acceleration in our cardiac rhythm management and vascular portfolios. In electrophysiology, sales grew 18%, driven by double-digit growth in all major geographic regions, and across all major product categories, including double-digit growth in ablation catheters and cardiac mapping-related products. We continue to make great progress toward bringing our innovative PFA catheter, Volt, to market. In March, we completed enrollment in our CE Mark clinical study, putting us on track to file for international approval 
before the end of the year. We also recently began enrolling patients in our U.S. clinical trial called Volt AF, which will generate the data needed to support an FDA approval filing. In structural heart, growth of 13% was led by strong performance in several high growth areas, including TAVR, LAA, mitral, and tricuspid repair. Structural heart is an area that we have invested in over the past years in order to create a diversified portfolio that can sustainably deliver double-digit growth. In the past, we relied almost exclusively on MitraClip to drive the growth, but today the portfolio and growth are more balanced and reflect increasing contributions from newer products like Navitor, Anglit, and TriClip. In April, we received FDA approval for TriClip, a first-of-its-kind heart valve repair device designed for the treatment of tricuspid regurgitation or a leaky tricuspid valve. Data from the clinical trial supporting this approval demonstrated that patients who received TriClip experienced a significant improvement in the severity of their symptoms and quality of life. We're excited to now offer this life-changing treatment option to people in the United States that suffer from this condition. In rhythm management, growth of 7.5% was led by Avair, our recently launched leadless pacemaker. Avair has rapidly captured market share in the single chamber pacing segment of the market and is now being used for dual chamber pacing, which is the largest segment of the pacing market. This revolutionary technology is helping to deliver growth rates in our rhythm management business that significantly exceed the overall growth in this market. And lastly, in neuromodulation, sales grew 17% driven by Eterna, a rechargeable neurostimulation device for pain management. And in January, we announced the launch of Liberta, the world's smallest rechargeable deep brain stimulation device, which is used to treat movement disorders such as Parkinson's disease. So in summary, we're off to a very good start to the year, exceeding expectations on both top and bottom lines, and as a result, we raise the midpoint of our sales and EPS guidance ranges. We continue to make good progress on our gross margin expansion initiatives, and we're seeing strong returns from the investments we're making across our growth platforms. Our pipeline has continued to be highly productive, delivering several recently new product approvals, and we're very well positioned to continue to deliver strong results for the remainder of the year. And I'll turn over the call to Phil. Thanks, Robert. As Mike mentioned earlier, please note that all references to sales growth rates, unless otherwise noted, are on an organic basis. Turning to our first quarter results, sales increased 4.7% on an organic basis, which as expected includes the impact of year-over-year decline in COVID testing related sales. Excluding COVID testing sales, underlying base business organic sales growth was 10.8% in the quarter. Foreign exchange had an unfavorable year-over-year impact of 2.9% on first quarter sales. During the quarter, we saw the U.S. dollar strengthen versus several currencies, which resulted in exchange having a more unfavorable impact on sales compared to exchange rates at the time of our earnings call in January. Regarding other aspects of the P&L, the adjusted gross margin ratio was 55.7% of sales. Adjusted R&D was 6.7% of sales, and adjusted SG&A was 29.4% of sales in the first quarter. Lastly, our first quarter adjusted tax rate was 15%. Turning to our outlook for the full year, we now forecast full year adjusted earnings per share of $4.55 to $4.70, which represents an increase at the midpoint of the range compared to the guidance range we provided in January. We also raised the midpoint of our guidance for organic sales growth. We now forecast organic sales growth, excluding COVID testing, to be in the range of 8.5 to 10%. Based on current rates, we expect exchange to have an unfavorable impact of approximately 2.5% on full year reported sales, which includes an expected unfavorable impact of approximately 3% on second quarter reported sales. 
Lastly, for the second quarter, we forecast adjusted earnings per share of $1.08 to $1.12. With that, we'll now open the call for questions. Thank you. At this time, we will conduct the question and answer session. As a reminder, to ask a question, you will need to press star 1-1 on your telephone. You will then hear an automated message advising you that your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 1-1 again. For optimal sound quality, we kindly ask that you please use your handset instead of your speakerphone when asking your question. Again, that's star 1-1 to ask a question. Please stand by while we compile the Q&A roster. And our first question will come from Robbie Marcus from J.P. Morgan. Your line is open. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for taking the question. Congrats on a nice first quarter here. Um, two for me. I'll, I'll just ask them both up front. Um, first, Robert, you know, we, we almost never see Abbott raise um, guidance, particularly on the top line in the first quarter. Looking back over the past, I don't know, five, ten years, it's, it's very rare. So... First part is, what gave you the confidence to raise uh, the midpoint of the guidance this early on in the year? And then second, um, you know, obviously there's been a lot of concern during the quarter uh, with competitors' uh, loss in a case for NEC as it relates to infant nutrition. I was hoping you could address that. You know, what's your stance on, on the ongoing litigation? I think there's about 1,000 cases that have been filed and any upcoming data points or timelines we should be looking for. Thanks a lot. Sure, Robbie. Um, uh, so let's go first to your question on the guidance. Um, yeah, you're right. Um, I, I, I guess I had to go back and take a look at that. I think the last time we, we did raise in Q1 was, was in 2016. Uh, I'd say the framework here, Robbie, as we've always done, is we, we, we set a guidance at the beginning of the year, which we believe is top tier. Uh, and then throughout the year, then throughout the year, we want to beat that guidance, right? And, and we consider top tier to be, you know, high single digit, double digit EPS growth. And, uh, you know, that's obviously excluded the COVID testing portion, which, you know, is, is what investors are, are, are really uh, more focused on. Uh, so that was the guidance that we set, you know, a couple months ago back in January. And, you know, we'll target always um, have that top tier guidance and, and, and find the appropriate balance between, you know, the opportunities um, and, you know, and obviously the challenges uh, that, you know, bracket, bracket that range. Uh, if you remember in January, I said I thought that there was more opportunities uh, than risks. Um, and, um, you know, I think that some of the risks that, you know, we saw in January, I, you know, I still think, you know, they're, they haven't gone away. They're still there, whether it's geopolitics or whether it's FX, those are still there. But clearly, the performance of the business continues to be very, very strong. And, and, and some of our businesses, a lot of our businesses, actually accelerating our, uh, in, in performance. So this, as I said in my comments, five consecutive quarters of, of double-digit uh, growth here. So, and so you look at each of the businesses, you know, EPD, uh, you know, consecutive, uh, three consecutive years of double-digit growth, great margin expansion, and the teams are now working to be able to introduce, uh, you know, biosimilars in all the markets that, you know, that, that we're, uh, we're participating in. Nutrition has done an incredible job at recovering share uh, and, and growing our adult business. Um, you know, we've, we've grown adult over a billion dollars versus 2019. Diagnostics continues to have a great track record here of outperforming the market. We've got some great large account wins, both in the U.S. and internationally that we're rolling out into this year. And, and medical devices, I mean, what can I tell you? It's just been uh, a, a, a real strong performer. The team's done an incredible job there. Last year, we were the fastest growing uh, med tech company, um, at least from what I've seen from our guidance and from the other guidances in the market. That's what it seems to be again this year. So you put all that together, plus the pipeline that's been contributing to an accelerated 
mid level, uh, great new product approvals. I put all that together and, and I just feel that this type of performance that we deliver just gives us the confidence uh, for the remainder of the outlook of the year. So we felt comfortable um, raising the guidance um, again um, you know, in the first quarter, which is, you know, as you pointed out, something that we don't, we don't usually do. Uh, and I continue to believe going into, uh, you know, going into the second quarter uh, as we move through that there's probably more opportunities than risks here um, as we move forward. So uh, I guess that's the framework of, of raising our guidance uh, in the first quarter, which is something that we usually don't do, just great performance and, and great momentum. Um, and then your other question was regarding, uh, regarding the net cases. Um, uh, I'd say from a uh, from a from a, uh, a date, yeah, we have uh, we have some uh, some court uh, cases that will happen uh, in July, so that's maybe uh, you know a milestone that we want to look at. But if you're asking me about kind of our framework of how we look at this, I'd say for decades we've provided specialized nutrition products that help doctors. I think that's a key thing here. Uh, it helps doctors provide the life-saving nutrition to the premature infants. Uh, and how you feed a premature infant, uh, it's a medical decision, uh, Robbie. And healthcare providers, they're going to use a range of options uh, to meet the unique needs of, of each baby. Um, and that includes mother's milk, that includes pasteurized donor's milk, but that also includes preterm infant formula because where mother's milk is not available, there is not a sufficient supply of donor milk to satisfy the nutritional needs of all of these premature infants that are born in the U.S. And, and, and quite frankly, even when they're available for some premature infants, human milk uh, may lack some of the calories, the proteins, the vitamins, et cetera, that are necessary to support the nutritional needs of the premature infants. Uh, so, you know, that milk, uh, that mother's milk needs to be fortified uh, in order to boost the, the nutritional output. And, and the medical community, they consider these products to be critical, um, a critical part of the standard of care for feeding premature infants. You know, most of the societies, when you read their, you know, when you read their positions, it is a standard of care to use these products. So the doctors who work in the NICUs, uh, they've used our products for decades and they continue to do so today. Uh, and countless babies, Robbie, have, been, have benefited from these products, life-saving uh, experiences over many, many years. And there are clinical studies that have repeatedly established um, that these products are safe. So, you know, so these litigation cases, uh, they're really seeking to advance a theory promoted by plaintiff lawyers that distorts the science and it distorts, um, you know, distorts everything that we know, and it's not supported uh, by the medical community. So, you know, we're, uh, we're preparing for our cases to be able to kind of lay out, you know, the facts, the science, and the data, and, and we stand behind our products. Appreciate it, Robert. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Our next question will come from Larry Beagleson from Wells Fargo. Your line is now open. Uh, good morning. I'll, I'll, I'll echo uh, Robbie's congratulations on the on the uh, strong start to the year here. Thank, um, so, so Robert, I just wanted to focus on on EP. Um, so, multi part question here, but but just one. Um, so, the EP business grew nicely in the first quarter in the U.S. and outside the U.S. Can you talk about what drove that? you know, what you're seeing with PFA and the different geographies, um, your expectations, you know, for your EP business going forward, you know, before the vault uh, launch. And just lastly, um, so it sounds like uh, we should expect vault approval in Europe sometime next year uh, based on the filing date. Uh, just want to confirm that. Thanks for taking the question. Sure. Yeah, like I said in my opening comments, we completed uh, we completed the trial. There's a six month follow up, Larry. Uh, so that means that we we will be on on target here to file for uh, you know C mark by the end of this year, uh, and then it's just going to depend on uh, you know on that process. So I think that's uh, that that's probably our, our our anchor point here is getting the filing in uh, before the end of the year. Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I, I, I mean, I'm not surprised by our EP growth. I know many, many on the call might be, uh, but I'm not surprised. Um, we, you know, first of all, it's an important, uh, it's an important therapy. It's an underpenetrated uh, disease, so we know there's uh, plenty of uh, growth in this segment, um, and as a result of that, it's, you know, it's highly competitive, right? So. Um, but I, you know, we haven't been surprised by the growth. I, I you know, if you look at PFA, uh, it's been in Europe for three years. If you average our growth rate over those last three years in Europe, we've been growing, uh, we've been growing mid-teens, um, and um, the growth it remains broad base. It was broad base in Europe again this quarter, where we saw double-digit growth in in ablation catheters. So not just on the mapping side, on the ablation catheter side also, uh, but then also great growth on, on the mapping side. And, and yeah, the, the, this technology has now come to the U.S. Um, I think we've probably had maybe two months uh, of seeing the, the, the technology uh, be rolled out here in the U.S. I think the competitors have been, you know, very aggressive here in terms of uh, bringing the technology uh, to the accounts in the U.S. And I can say uh, we've mapped a lot of those cases, Larry. I'm not going to say we've been in every single case, but I'd say uh, a vast majority of the cases we've been in there. And uh, there are some similarities to Europe, uh, but there are some differences to Europe. Um, I think one of the things that we saw in Europe um, was that there was this uh, inclination to use the technology starting off as, as kind of a one-shot. Uh, so that had an impact more on you know, the cryo business than I would say on the RF side. And that's what we saw in our mapping cases. Uh, we saw here, at least, at least in the first couple of months, that's where the, a large portion of those cases occurred, at least the ones that we mapped were in places where they were traditionally using cryo. Um, I think the difference that we saw a little bit in Europe is that uh, at least 90% of the cases that we were part of, directly or indirectly, uh, were using mapping as a, you know, uh, using mapping, that, that number was slow, was lower in Europe. Uh, so that's probably a little bit of the difference I saw here in the U.S. Um, and that bodes well for us, right? Our, our end site system, uh, our mapping system, our mapping catheters are, are, are widely viewed as, as an excellent option here for mapping uh, these PFA cases. We have a large install base. Customers are familiar with it. Uh, don't need to make room. Don't need to fight for capital. We've got best-in-class clinical support. And the, 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 the architecture here is open, as I've said in previous calls. So it integrates well with these, uh, with these PFA catheters. Uh, uh, we, we actually recently released a software upgrade uh, last month that provides even better visualization to these catheters uh, and potential for faster procedures and, and, and less fluoro time. So um, I think this is a perfect combination, uh, quite frankly, in a time where there's going to be uh, you know, market transition. Uh, there's a lot of new products. There's a lot of choices. And when you have a situation like that, I think flexibility is key. And, and, and that's what we heard uh, from our customers. Uh, one data point that I thought was also interesting to your question of what helped drive that, in the cases that we were part of and we saw, um, we also observed that uh, an RF catheter was pulled uh, in about a quarter of the cases that we saw. Uh, so on top of the PFA uh, catheter, an RF catheter was pulled, uh, you know, to do touch-ups, et cetera. So, um, you know, I, I'd say right now um, everything uh, that we've seen in Europe, uh, you know, on the positive side is happening, and then I think there's some, some interesting dynamics here in the U.S. that could be favorable for us also. But it's still very early. Um, and, um, you know, if I look at March, we had probably one of our most, uh, you know, we look at cases per day. Uh, that was probably one of our highest uh, months. So, um, so this, you know, so far so good. And, uh, you know, we're excited about the technology. We're excited about our program. Uh, we released data on our program uh, in, in some recent medical uh, um, uh, uh, meetings that occurred, um, and the feedback uh, from those that have been using our product are, are very positive, and the integration with Insight, uh, in, including like the tissue contact force algorithm and the visualization, all of that is seen as, as a real promise and a differentiator versus what's being used today. So, Thanks so much.
Thank you. Our next question will come from Josh Jennings from Cowan. Your line is now open. Good morning. Thanks for taking the questions, and great to see the strong start here. Q1 results. Um, Robert, I was hoping to just ask first on, on Libre and uh, just internationally, any other uh, payment or, or coverage decisions that we should have on our radar in, in various countries? Um, sounds like you've made some nice progress already in Germany. And then in the U.S., I was hoping you could just help, help or share your thoughts on the, uh, the share gain opportunity in the integrated pump segment of the CGM market versus the, the share loss risk in, in the type two non insulin cash pay segment with the, with the competitive launch here in early in 2024. I just have one follow up. Uh, sure. Uh, on the uh, on your international question, I mean, it's always difficult to forecast exactly, you know, by month or quarter, uh, you know, uh, coverage kind of payment decisions. Um, I can tell you, though, that the team has a, you know, full global map of all the work that's being done, you know, regarding clinical information and negotiations, et cetera. So, um, so it's difficult to kind of forecast it. But what I have said is, is, you know, on previous calls and on some of my prepared remarks that I think you're going to see this, uh, you know, there's just this, this build that will be occurring globally uh, in the market as the data uh, proves and shows the, uh, you know, the clinical, medical, and health economic benefit by reimbursing for this patient population. And I think we're well positioned there. Uh, internationally, I think we got some pretty large markets already, Canada, Japan, France, Italy, uh, Germany. Those are markets that are are, you know, you know, either fully reimbursed or starting their process. And like I said, I, I think you'll see, um, you know, as the year progresses, you know, whether it's in, you know, medical events or, or just as the year progresses, I think you'll see more uh, coverage decisions. You know, maybe they don't get splashy, you know, big PR news, but we are seeing continuous uh, increasing there uh, on that. Um, on the U.S. side, um, I, I guess I disagree with your premise uh, that I'm going to be trading share gains on the pump side for share losses on the um, on the uh, on the uh, on the non-insulin side. I mean, I'm just uh, right now. I'm looking at the data, uh, third-party audited data. Seven out of every ten new prescriptions for this basal population, which is primarily primarily served by the primary care channel, uh, seven out of 10 are going to Libre. And uh, I think our product's gonna get even more competitive and, and compelling. Um, so uh, I think this is a great opportunity and, 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 and our objective here is to maintain kind of our shared dominance uh, and our shared leadership um, as it results to, you know, as it results in this patient segment. But we do have an opportunity here to, you know, to participate a little bit more actively in, in, in what is a, a little bit more of a smaller segment of the population, uh, but nonetheless a, a very important one, uh, which is the, you know, the AID and the, and the market system. So, you know, there's there's 150 to 200 new thousand starts a year. Uh, there's an opportunity for share gain also of existing uh, users. Um, I think that the opportunity to bring a a dual analyte sensor with ketones. Uh, we showed some data at ATDD this year that showed, you know, the, the safety benefit uh, or the value proposition of a dual analyte sensor for AID system. Um, so I think that's going to be a compelling value proposition. And then we're working with all the all the all the pump companies here. And I think as uh, as the year progresses, we'll see uh, connectivity occur, whether it's with uh, Libre 2 Plus, our streaming product, or whether it's with Libre 3. So you know, this is an area that we're focusing on, um, and uh, it's, a, it's a new segment for us uh, to compete in, but I don't think that we're going to be taking our eye off the ball as it relates to, um, you know, as it relates to, uh, you know, the basal opportunity that exists, so. Understood. Thanks. And I just wanted to ask on the transcatheter tricuspid market, congratulations on the triclip approval, but there's been some uh, questions around the, the patient opportunity breakdown between tier and triclip and, and replacement uh, with VOC. Um, maybe just any, any internal team thoughts on that patient opportunity breakdown and, and then anything you could share on the pricing strategy for triclip in the setting of a competitor pricing its, its replacement device at a significant premium. Thanks for taking the questions. 
you know, I'm not going to comment on our pricing strategy here just for competitive reasons. Um, you know, we are, uh, it is a differentiated and, 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 and novel technology, so there, uh, there is an opportunity, but, um, you know, we'll, we'll have to see how, uh, how this all plays out. You know, you've got NTAP submissions and all this stuff going on right now. What we're focused on here is launching the product um, and, and getting cases uh, ramped up, um, and, uh, and, and that's what's happening. Um, I, I got some feedback yesterday from the team after a couple of weeks. Uh, a real nice cadence uh, of growth. We're obviously focusing uh, our initial cases on, you know, most of the uh, accounts that were part of our pivotal trial. Uh, but just real nice cadence growth there, and, and and great feedback from physicians and patients. You know, post post surgery. I mean, if you're trying to poke at, you know, what's the what's the breakdown going to be about replace and uh, and and, and repair. Listen, I think it's good to have options. Um, and uh, I guess my view here is is that I, I, I believe that probably safety is a, is a, is a key driver here um, to, to start off with. And I think TriClip has shown a very strong, excellent safety record, uh, both in clinical trials and, and real-world use. Uh, so I think that's going to play a, a key role here in determining repair versus replace. So I expect, I expect repair or TriClip at least to be the preferred option unless the valves are too damaged uh, and then obviously uh, replacement is 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 the only remaining option. So, uh, but there's a there's a large pool of patients here. Um, you know, you got five million people globally, two million people here in the U.S. Um, and um, you know, it's going to be an opportunity here that uh, we'll be generating more data, expand the indication of the product. Um, so I think this is uh, this is easily a billion dollar opportunity for us here uh, as we build, um, you know, as we build the capabilities and as we build uh, more clinical data. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Travis Speed from B of A Securities. Your line is open. Hey, congrats on the good quarter. Um, maybe just uh, while we're on the pipeline, talk a little bit about Avir. It sounds like that, that product's going really well. And then I had a question on gross margins as well, trying to think about is this the, the right pace uh, to kind of get back to pre-COVID levels and, uh, and is that still the opportunity you kind know, of longer term for, for gross margins? Yeah, I mean, I think Avera has done very well. Um, I mean, we know, we all know the, the the advantages it has over the competitive system, whether it's uh, single and dual chamber, the longer lasting battery, the ability for uh, replacement, retrievability, uh, upgradeability. So I think it's done very well. Uh, from a single chamber perspective, I think we're now at about 50 share of the U.S. market. Uh, so that's been doing very well. It's performed. We started doing our, our, our dual chamber uh, procedures uh, towards the end of last year, uh, seeing a nice kind of ramp up uh, over over uh, this first quarter here. Uh, focus here really is a, a really about. It's a completely different procedure, right? Uh, I mean, if you think about. Uh, how these these devices have been implanted. This is probably the first time in like 30 years that you have like a real meaningful change on how this is done. So our focus here is really getting great clinical results, a uh, real thoughtful approach here about opening new centers and training, uh, and that's been working very well for us. And you could see the impact on our growth rate. You know, uh, I mean, historically our CRM business has been relatively flat. Um, you know, with some platforms going up, some platforms going down. So our, our goal here with this program was to get uh, our CRM portfolio to, to at least be, um, you know, a contributor to growth, you know, mid-single digits, 6 7%. So these last couple of quarters, we've, we've done 7.5%. And, and, uh, and so Avera has been doing well, and it's going to continue to get better as more and more physicians get trained and we, and, and we increase the amount of accounts. So I really like the cadence uh, of, uh, of how we're forecasting this business and the impact that it's going to have on our CRM portfolio. Um, what was your other question? Just on, on gross margins, kind of thinking about the, the path back to, to pre-COVID levels you know, over over the long term, and uh, if, is this the right kind of cadence that you're – this year's cadence, the right way to think about that? 
Uh, yeah, I mean, I think that's that's you know that's uh, that's a good cadence. You know, I think we're forecasting here about 70 basis points of uh, of improvement this year. I feel good about that. Um, you know, I've, I've talked about this not being a question of if, just a question of when. So I think that's not a bad cadence. Uh, and we're going to focus on the things that we can control. And the things that we can control are uh, are obviously um, uh, our cost and, and our cost uh, cost teams and, and and the teams that are working on. On improving gross margin, uh, they're delivering great results here. While at the same time maintaining high service levels, you know, not running into back orders, etc. Uh, but probably the biggest, uh, the biggest opportunity we have here, uh, uh, Travis, is just to expand uh, the gross margin through uh, through portfolio mix, right? So when you have uh, our, our medical device businesses uh, growing at you know mid teens consistently. Consistently over the last, you know, whatever four or five quarters, that has a, a real strong impact on uh, on our gross margin. So a, a lot of focus on what we can control our gross margin, the cadence. You know, that's what we're, that's what we're targeting. Uh, so it's not really a question of uh, of if; it's just a question of when. Great. Thanks a lot, and congrats again. Thank you. Our next question will come from Vijay Kumar from Evercore ISI. Your line is open. Hey, guys. Uh, thanks for uh, taking my question, Robert. I had a two-part question. Um, a lot of questions on pipeline, but I'm curious, uh, you know, uh, when people ask us on sustainability of growth, uh, if you could elaborate on, um, you know, pipeline, what else is there, you know, when you look at the future that gives us the confidence of sustaining as premium um, premium growth within the medtech industry. And, and my second part was uh, on the financial modeling side. Looks like FX headwinds came in a little bit higher. Prior guidance had assumed 20 cents headwind to EPS from FX. Did that increase? Um, I'm just curious on, on because some questions on why the high end of the guidance was not raised. I suspect FX uh, headwinds increase. Thank you. Yeah, as I said, uh, you know, there are certain challenges that still remain with us from January, um, and, and FX is one of them. I'll, I'll let Phil answer that one. On your question on pipeline, listen, I could I could spend a whole hour on this just going through the pipeline, but I guess I would bucket them into like three categories. Um, uh, VJ, I'd say you got you got your current contributors, and, you know, Libre and Alidity, they still operate like pipeline projects uh, and, and and products, right? We still got multiple innovations going through them. My Clip, great familiarity, Aver, Navitor, Triclip, you know, Amulet, Protality, our, 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 our concussion test, I think, has got great opportunity in cardio mems. I mean, these are all products that, you know, I would still characterize them as early innings. Yeah, they're, they're, they're established, but they're still early innings, and they got a lot of growth right there. You know, the second group of products I would call probably near-term future contributors. So think about it in the next, you know, 12 to 18 months, these products coming to market and starting to kind of generate revenue there. Uh, you know, our, our Lingo product, uh, I'm very excited about that and bringing that to the U.S. and expanding that globally. Uh, our, uh, you know, dual analyte sensor, uh, our Volt system, um, Esprit, which is uh, our, you know, drug eluding bioabsorbable stent for below the knee. It'll be the first of its kind. Uh, we're developing a whole new alinity uh, system uh, that will target a segment of the market that we currently don't participate in, and there'll be more to come on that. And then just the great opportunity we have with biosimilars into the emerging markets and doing it in a very capital efficient way uh, and bringing that and leveraging our, our position there. You know, that's our, you know, next 12 to 18 month kind of catalyst there. And and then, you know, thinking about beyond 2026, I mean, we're working on a PFA RF catheter. You got leadless, uh, uh, another kind of leadless uh, uh, pacing system uh, that we'll be launching. We have a second generation amulet. Um, excited about entering into the IVL market, you know, sometime in 2027. Uh, coronary DCB. Uh, we're, we're, we're working on kind of new TAVR systems also that allow us to, uh, you know, branch out into other segments. We've got 
uh, a whole plethora of new analytes in our biowearables uh, market that will, you know, that will start to come out um, and have different applications in 2026. And then on top of that, all the clinical work that we're doing to expand indications, expand market, whether it's, you know, in TAVR, whether it's in LAA, whether it's in mitral. Uh, so we've got, uh, I'd say, a real nice cadence here uh, of products uh, and pipeline, uh, you know, beyond, you know, I'd say the next 12, 18 months. We're looking at this, you know, 26, 27, 28, and I feel really excited about that. There's obviously more that we, we need to do and add, but uh, I think the base here is, looks really good in terms of the pipeline. And then I think your question on FX, Phil, you want to take that? Yeah, so uh, I mentioned uh, at the onset here, BJ in Q1, uh, we saw about a 2.9% headwind on sales growth, uh, and, and we kind of at current rates anticipate something similar here in Q2 from a full year perspective at the current rates. Uh, it's about a 2.5% uh, headwind on the top line. That said, the kind of the earnings guide that we have here is, is in line with the organic sales uh, performance and, and drop through to, to earnings uh, on, the, on the increased uh, midpoint and on EPS guidance. Thanks, guys. Thank you. And our next question will come from Joanne Wunsch from City. Your line is now open. Uh, good morning, and may I add my um, compliments and congratulations to the quarter. Um, I have two questions, put them right up front. The, f the first one is on the concussion testing. Um, I'd love to understand the go-to-market strategy for that, how you think about the financial um, benefit impact and all that kind of good stuff. But I, I think my second question is a little bit more big picture. You know, as you step back in a post-pandemic environment a couple of years into the CEO seat, how do you think about taking Abbott sort of to the next level? I mean, we all sit here and take a look at um, an incredibly strong balance sheet. How do you put that cash to work? And are these um, segments, divisions, ones you want to keep, or how do you think about adding to it? Thank you. Sure. Uh, on the point of care uh, concussion test, uh, I, I guess I'd, I'd summarize the opportunity here in twofold. I think there's a, I think there's a market conversion uh, component to this, uh, Joanne. Uh, you know, I mentioned there are five million uh, ER visits uh, to, uh, you know, uh, diagnose a, uh, a concussion. You know, the, the 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 number one method there to use that is on a CT scan. Um, and uh, I think there's an opportunity here to transform that and uh, and allow one to get a faster uh, response, you know, in that emergency kind of emergency room visit, which is where the you know which is where the ISTAT and the point of care team have uh, you know already have good uh, a good position with some of our other blood gas uh, and other um, uh, and other assays that we provide to that segment. So I think this will just slide right into that team and then the value proposition here is going to be okay what you know what's the cost of the system and can we you know can we bend that cost curve I think we've shown a little bit how we think about things Joanne if you look at Libre if you look at Binax if you look at how we think about pricing our products when it comes to market conversion uh, and the opportunities that we have there uh, and we'll be able to do it uh, at a, a, a you know at a nice return for our shareholders so um, so I think that's that's an important part. Uh, the market expansion opportunity that we have, uh, I think, is is going to still require some work on the product. Right now, the product's approved whole blood, uh, but it's a venous draw. If uh, we're, we're going to be working on a capillary draw, uh, and if you can then run this assay, you know, taking a sample from a finger stick. Uh, from a finger prick, uh, then you can look at bringing that technology uh, even closer uh, to where uh, the need for a rapid concussion test would be. You can just look at how many universities uh, exist in this country, how many high schools exist in this country. You can do some multiplications there and say, okay, this is a, this is a great uh, market creation, market expansion opportunity. Um, so I think that that's, uh, that's how we're thinking about it commercially. Uh, conversion and, and creation slash expansion. Uh, there's some more work to be done in terms of the product and the claims and the, and the trials there. So this is a, uh, uh, this will be a uh, multi-year kind of program over here where we'll start to see kind of nice growth in that, in that segment. 
Um, and then your other question was about the portfolio and 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 balance sheet and you know do we like the four segments and uh, and you know the answer to that is yes we like all the four segments we uh, we feel that it gives us a real unique view into the healthcare system as a whole you know starting with nutrition um, that's obviously the bedrock of good health uh, but then you know things happen and you need to get a diagnosis and you know we've got a great diagnostic portfolio that we've been expanding on and building on to make sure that we can capture capitalize on all the different uh, types of modalities and locations where people can get tested. And then, you know, once, once we know, once, you know, a physician knows what, what the problem is, then, you know, then they got to run through treatment, right? And, and we do that uh, either through our medicines business uh, or, through a med, or, or through a medical device business. So I think all four segments uh, are, are super well aligned to, uh, you know, the global, uh, global demographics and trends in healthcare. Um, and uh, so we like that. There's always opportunities to add, and, and we've shown that if there are areas that we feel that we can bring value uh, in, in a combination, um, then, you know, as you mentioned, yeah, we've got, we've got a strong balance sheet and strategic flexibility to do that as long as, you know, we feel that we can, you know, we can add value uh, to that asset. We felt like that about CSI. We felt like that about St. Jude. We felt like that about Alir. Um, and uh, and those 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 deals, um, you know, they 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 obviously uh, help kind of reshape the company and and, and accelerate our, our growth rates. But I think that's predicated on us really believing that we can kind of bring value, and uh, you know, we're not trying to fill you know some top line gap or or, or some issues. So ROIC for us matters, profitability matters. Um, so we've got opportunities, and we could be a little bit more selective to be able to. Add, but I like the four segments that we're in, and uh, and they and they they they've they've been well to shareholders, uh, especially the long-term shareholders. Thank you. Thank you. Our next question will come from Matt Mixig from Barclays. Your line is open. Hey, good morning. Thanks for uh, for fitting me in, um, and congrats on the uh, on the really strong quarter, particularly in med devices. So, um, I had one follow up on um, the uh, on the uh, sorry here for the background. Um, one question on structural heart, um, Robert. You talked a little bit about the portfolio, um, and you know the the combination of uh, of uh, you know the leading. Peer device and MitraClip being a little bit more mature in the in the category of, of structural heart, uh, but being kind of augmented by some of these uh, some of these new products uh, like most recently, obviously TriClip. Um, and if you could talk a little bit about you know sort of the momentum in those in the portfolio as well as you know how much of the build out of this portfolio is still uh, you know, coming organically or, you know, under review kind of strategically. Um, I appreciate it. Sure. I mean, I, I didn't want my comments on, on, on my trickly to be construed like, oh, that, that, that one there is slowing down and, uh, you know, we're relying on others to drive the growth. I mean, that, that wasn't the intent. If you look at my trickle this quarter, it's glowed high single digits. Uh, and if you look at the last five quarters, that's what it's been doing between high single digits, low double digits. And that's good. Uh, but we always had a view here that this was an attractive area uh, of growth, an attractive area of medical need, and we wanted to be we wanted to be a leader here. So yeah, MitraClip. I guess we can call MitraClip the founding father of our structural heart portfolio. Uh, but I think the team here has done an incredible job of, at, at bringing organic. Uh, innovation into into the into the portfolio. So if you look at our structural heart, I mean, we grew 13% today. Uh, MitraClip grew high single digits, uh, but it you know it accounted for 3% of that uh, of that growth. Um, you know the rest the the other 10% came from all the rest of the portfolio uh, that's being built. So um, so I think that. You know, you'll continue to see that. We'll continue to make investments in this business, continue to make investments in the pipeline. 
Um, I'd say right now most of it is organic, whether it's, uh, you know, uh, you know, innovating on LAA, uh, innovating on, on our TAVR side, um, and, um, and, all the, and all the clinical trial work that we're doing there. Uh, if there's an opportunity um, inorganically, I, I just put that in the same bucket, um, you know, that I think I answered kind of Joanne's question here is if it, if it makes sense and, and we can add it, we, we've got the flexibility to do it. But uh, the whole strategy here was to say, listen, we're going to build a multi-billion dollar structural heart business that can sustainably grow double digits. And the way to do that is you can't be a, you know, you can't be a, 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 a you know, a, a division of only one product, and I think the teams over the last four or five years have done a really good job at building that, and there's more opportunity. I'd say probably the one that we're looking at um, and um, is very exciting for us is uh, mitral replacement. Um, you know, we've launched, uh, you know, we launched a Tendine product, which was more a, a transapical system. Uh, our Cephia system uh, is a transfemoral, transeptal, and, um, you know, feedback that we've seen from early implanters, early first in man is that this is a great, great valve. Uh, so there's an opportunity there also. So uh, I'd say most organic, but, you know, got the capacity for an organic if it makes sense. Thanks so much. Operator will take one more question, please. Thank you. And our final question will come from Danielle Antolfi from UBS. Your line is open. Hey, good morning, everyone. Thanks so much for taking the question. And yes, congrats on a, on a strong start to the year. Uh, Robert, we spent a lot of time uh, talking about the, the durability of growth in, in the med tech business. So I don't want to get too greedy, but just following up on Joanne's question regarding, you know, you guys do have a strong balance sheet. Are there any areas, I guess sort of how do you feel about the state of the med tech business today? And, and do you feel there are growth areas within med tech that maybe Abbott isn't participating in today that Abbott could or should participate in today? Um, and where are you looking beyond um, your, your current market, if, if at all? Thanks so much. I'll just leave it to one. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I get the, the attempt for triangulation here and the multiple different ways, and, and, and I guess I'll sound a little bit boring here uh, in terms of how I talk about this. Um, I've been public that, yeah, we are interested. We look, you know, we look at areas that we can add value to. Um, I, I'd say probably the ones that have uh, uh, jumped out more at us in terms of us studying and looking are probably more in the, in the medical device side and on, on, on the diagnostic side. Um, we did look at, you know, uh, a strategy for biosimilars uh, for, our, for, for our medicines business, and that was a, a pretty capital efficient way uh, to do it. Um, so, yeah, we're looking. Uh, we continue to study, uh, but I'm not going to... I'm not going to sit here and telegraph exactly, you know, it's this, it's that. I, I think the key thing here is just we, we. I, I mean, look at our med tech business did uh, this quarter. Look what it did previous four quarters. And um, that allows me to be a little bit more selective. You know, uh, yeah, the, over the last couple of months, we've seen some, some fairly large transactions um, in, in the med tech space. Uh, those seem to be uh, attractive growth areas. Um, I, I talked about us um, getting access to some early IVL technology with the CSI acquisition, so that's an important area for us uh, to focus on. Uh, but I don't feel that, um, you know, with our strong organic growth that, um, you know, we need to go out and, um, and, and not pay attention to, like, other key financial metrics that for us are important, right, uh, in terms of ROICs and, and others because we've got that strong growth rate in, in, in MedTech. So um, I, you, you, you won't get me telegraphing here exactly, Danielle, um, you know, what specific segments we're looking at. What I can tell you is we have an active team. Uh, they study a lot. We look a lot. We, we follow uh, a lot. And, you know, if there's a moment that makes sense for us uh, and those segments continue to be interesting, Interesting. Yeah, we've got the balance sheet uh, and the track record uh, to show that we can drive value out of these uh, out of these acquisitions. So, um, 
so I'll just leave it like that. Uh, yes, we've got flexibility. Uh, that doesn't mean that uh, we don't uh, pay attention to other uh, other key financial um, uh, kind of returns uh, as we're looking at it. And and I feel that I can do that because you know we've got such a strong uh, top line growth and, and great pipeline and prospects. So um, so with that, I'll leave it. I'll, I'll leave it. I'll leave it like that, um, uh, and I'll just close by saying, listen, we're very pleased with a very strong start to the year. We delivered another quarter of double-digit organic sales growth on the base business. Uh, the investments that we've made during all those years of COVID are generating real strong returns. The pipeline continues to be highly productive, as I've, as I've outlined. We've got um, you know, clear visibility to a pipeline all the way out to 27, 28. Um, obtained several new product approvals that are going to help us, uh, you know, accelerate our growth uh, in certain areas. Uh, typically don't raise guidance uh, in the first quarter, but given the strong performance and the outlook uh, and the remainder of the year, we felt comfortable doing that and uh, we're very well positioned uh, to continue to sustainably deliver top tier results. So with that, I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up and uh, thank all of you for joining us today. Thank you, operator, and thank you all for your questions. This now concludes Abbott's conference call. A webcast replay of this call will be available after 11 a.m. Central Time today on Abbott's Investor Relations website at abbottinvestor.com. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Everyone, have a wonderful day.